Yeah, I think you should go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a uh, wonderful uh, to be with the uh, fellow PGIs and good to see my teachers and uh, all the colleagues here. So uh, the, the topic today was coronary physiology. Uh, the pure physiology is obviously boring, so I thought we should actually discuss uh, FFR, IFR, how to do it right, and maybe what are the problems that we uh, do uh, do FFR and uh, IFR. And uh, see, uh, the important thing is something with all of us know so that. I'll, uh, I'll request the panelists to switch off their mics so that the echo does not come. And whenever they need to say, they can just switch on the mic and uh, continue. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we know that uh, whatever looks significant in angio may not actually be significant. And the other way is also possible, especially when you are dealing with arteries like uh, LAD. Uh, it's also possible that what we feel as 50, 60 could actually be more significant. Because when we look at angio, we only look at uh, relative stenosis. We look at the normal segment. We look at the block. But we don't really think about the territory it is supplying and how uh, whether that territory is viable, is the territory small or territory is big. So we do not really think about the physiological aspect of the block. We just look at the anatomical aspect of the block. And that's where the coronary physiology mediated uh, uh, measurements have their own uh, role. All of us know that FFR is something which has been there for some time and it was one of the first uh, reproducible physiological measurements. It's very useful in intermediate lesion and that's what we have always been taught. But it's also, uh, the, it's also useful when you're dealing with serial lesions, when you think there is a side branch stenosis in so-called multi-vessel disease. You know, sometimes uh, even with the, uh, minimal disease, some of them are sent for uh, CABG. Uh, if we do FFR and uh, FFR-based syntax, uh, if we could do a FFR-based syntax, then uh, some of them could actually, at least one third of them can, could actually be angioplasty and they may not undergo uh, bypass. So thought or thinking that FFR actually reduces stenting is not true. When done properly, FFR could actually increase your uh, you know, uh, stenting. What does it do? It's very simple. You just measure the distal pressure and divide it by proximal pressure. How to do it? We'll come to it uh, very soon. But what is important is it's a very simple measurement of a distal pressure divided by proximal pressure. So we do uh, we know certain things, and I want to highlight these things based on the data. Now, what's the cutoff of FFR that we should be using? This is something which is uh, which uh, which you know people tend to debate. But based on the studies which we have, especially the Differ study, which probably is the first study, what Differ study to showed us is whenever the FFR is 0.75 and below or above, if the differ told the other way, if the differ is 0 0.75 or above, you could safely differ the lesion. Means you don't have to stand this lesion if it is above, whatever it looks. It might look 90%, it might look 30% or 50%, but it's above 0 0.75, then you don't need to stand. That's what the differ study showed. And what did FAME show? FAME 1 and FAME 2, these were, uh, these were huge randomized trials which were event-driven. And what they showed us is whenever FFR is less than 0.8, if you intervene, FFR-guided intervention, you're likely to do good. You're likely to prevent lots of events. And some of these events are actually driven by urgent revascularization, but you're likely to prevent these events. So what we know is it's safe to differ above 0.75 but it's, it's better to treat less than 0.8. So what this does is there is a small gray zone between 0.75 to 0.8. There's probably no gray zone above 0.8. There's no gray zone less than 0.75. The middle zone is still slightly gray, but even uh, that can be, uh, you know, that, that that's where the clinical judgment comes in. And if you are a believer of fame and fame too, I think 0.8 should be the cutoff, uh, uh, cutoff for uh, uh, these lesions. Now, fractional flow reason I already discussed. It's the uh, it's the pressure, distal pressure divided by proximal uh, pressure, and this is how it looks on monitor. So, when you look at the, uh, what what we should do is what I was trying to highlight is 
it's prone to lots of errors and dr smith already mentioned this it's not about the number what we tend to do is we tend to look at that pdpl or that number what we should understand it's not just about the number you need to look at the graphs you need to understand the graph and you need to make sure you're measuring it in the right point and you're closing it the right point you need to wait for maximal hyperemia it can't be that you push something and you know push plus and you get one or two beats variation in the in the uh, in in uh, some error and you're taking that number it's very important to equalize multiple times so in the presence of a significant coronary region the distal pressure drops and this could drop at baseline but ffr and also during maximal hyperemia so we need to produce a maximal hyperemia to be very sure that the lesion is significant or it is not significant but otherwise the mass of ffr as far as a single lesion is concerned is pretty simple now let's look at the screen in the screen what we see is we see a uh, uh, we see two pressure the red pressure is the aortic pressure and the green pressure is the distal pressure so you have pa and you have pd and you realize that the the pressure is actually uh, it uh, when you when whenever you press ffr the machine actually searches for maximal hyperemia and it would pick up probably this area which has the lowest uh, pressure and then it would give the ratio but it's also important for us to know if you are using intracoronary that in some time the pressure should reach normal at that time you don't want the distal pressure to overshoot the proximal pressure and the graph should be very identical now the advantage of ffr is no it's not just visible so now see the on your screen you see two graphs with almost equal looking stenosis in this case it looks like 60 Uh, uh, percent, but uh, RCA 60 may not be significant, but uh, left main or osteal LAD 60 could actually be significant. So it also depends on the perfusion area. If there's a huge perfusion area, the distal pressure. When you use uh, whatever agent you want to use and produce a vasodilation, the distal pressure actually falls, and the FFR uh, could actually be 0.70. And similar looking lesion. but which is now supplying a smaller area will have a higher distal pressure and higher uh, higher pressure the uh, one more advantage is it also although we should remember clearly ffr is not a sign or test for viability it's not a sign or test for viability but it does account the scarred myocardium so if you have a area of myocardium and half of it is scarred because of the old mi then the uh, distal pressure tends to be higher there is no area to steal that extra blood and the distal pressure tends to be higher and the ratio uh, even the lesion might look more significant but the ffr uh, will remain uh, uh, come higher so it's it's one way a good test to know that whether you whether stenting a lesion does benefit and it is much better than the Uh, visual estimation of the coronary uh, stenosis whenever there is a collateral uh, when uh, it's also useful to see uh, whether the collateral supply uh, is helping this myocardium now here we are not talking about imagine this is lad we are not talking about lad giving collateral to circumflex or rca we are talking the other way where there is a collateral from one more artery through a graft or through a conduit and you realize that the ffr actually is higher because of the collateral supply but the problem comes uh, the other problem is much more common where because this artery is now being collateral to one more artery the ffr of this the lesion might look 50 imagine lad is now giving collateral to rca lesion is 50 as long as rca is not open the ffr of lad could actually be positive so collaterals produce two ways if you are looking at this artery if there are collateral to say lad from a graft and if the ffr is higher you could safely leave it uh, leave this artery now trials i did discuss because these are the main important trial key point any value more than 0.75 you could defer if the patient asks is it safe for me to be on medicine if the value is 0.75 answer is yes and if the value is less than 0.8 treating it reduces uh, 
uh, reduces the overall outcome but this outcome is predominantly uh, actually uh, the repeat revascularization does come down and uh, the composite endpoint of reduced moderate and myocard uh, myocardial infarction was actually seen in both the trials and hence uh, the data for ffr guided intervention is uh, much high and especially in today's era with the trials like ischemia i think ffr guided intervention makes much more sense now how do we do it i'm sure most of you are using ffr in your uh, daily uh, practice now we have many vendors who have ffr ifr we have the also the centrude about was the first company to have it now you also have it with the um, philips you also have a um, uh, rfr uh, algorithms uh, uh, available ifr algorithm available boston also has come up with this ffr but the basic principle almost remains same so for uh, induced uh, there is one this one for induced outcome and there is one more for uh, the resting indices have one cut off and this indices have one cut off so general preparation is very important we need to flush the wire and when you are equalizing make sure the wire is at the level of the patient uh, on the table it's at the level and it's also important to flush it and make sure the tip is actually in uh, in contact with fluid when we do uh, it's like a simple ptca wire like any other wire and it is o14 wire it, it could actually be used as workhorse wire if you are doing some intervention So you keep it on the uh, level and make sure both are zeroed. Your aortic pressure is zeroed, and also the wire is zeroed. That's something which is very important. Once both are zeroed, you open the aortic pressure, but look at the zero. When you are dealing with FFR, IFR, uh, you know, don't just look at the number. It's very important for us to look at the uh, uh, the the screen and understand it. Uh, wire preparation it comes as a, it's a straight wire so we may have to curve it slightly because uh, we know that we need to enter uh, different areas with this wire uh, important uh, point to remember is we need a two e broad to you know that uh, introduce a needle to introduce the wire but as soon as you introduce during equalization you need to remove it you cannot equalize with the wire or with the needle that small change which of the pressure which which is produced by a presence of a introducer needle itself is enough to uh, uh, produce a artifact it's extremely sensitive so in this case when they actually equalized with the uh, with the two e broth and did the ffr actually came negative where the actual ffr was positive so it's very important to make sure that uh, that the two growth or the introducer need of what we what we keep should not be kept when we equalize that's a very important uh, message and it's very important to uh, follow it the next important message is equalize we need to equalize multiple times and uh, you can't have just one value less than 0.8 and you know jump at it it's very important that what we, we to understand that what we see is uh, is true and it is consistent so the first step is equalize where do we equalize if you are dealing with a non osteal lesion the equalization is actually in left main or it is beyond the guide the pressure monitor or the pressure transducer is actually at the distal uh, at the proximal tip of the wire so when we see a 3 cm meter of wire the pressure tip is actually at the proximal point so it's very important for us to cross the lesion beyond that uh, uh, lesion so this is the one point i am trying to re highlight do not equalize with the needle in uh, place just doing that you look at the screen whatever you see just doing it produces such a artifact that a positive ffr actually becomes negative so do not do it any time so remove it out and then equalize and that's a, that's probably very important uh, message then uh, then you look at the, what you find in the screen now uh, introducer needle produces lot of error look, just look at the screen Uh, this was the error see the ffr with the introducer needle was 0.79 and uh, without was 0.79 with this 0.83 so it does produces lot of uh, problem equalization is where the both the waveform come together i don't know whether the screen is very clear 
see initially it was not equalized so equalization is extremely important as some of the softwares it's called normalization if you are using philips but if it is if the others it is equalization so don't equalize there is always a phase difference so it's not just the wave difference there is also a phase difference so it's very important that you are outside the guiding catheter and you equalize if it is a non osteal lesion i'll discuss about the osteal lesion later Take up the pressure curve. That's very important for us to see, and please concentrate on the screen. Now, this is when the lesion was equalized. The first one which you are screening. If the lesion is actually significant, as we are producing the hyperemia, you could produce it IV or you could produce it as IC intracoronary. There is enough data to show that they are both comparable. The point is, this is how the waveform alters. The second box and the third box. The very important is distal well pressure tracing. If it is really significant, does not have incisura. The incisura. If you see the incisura, as you see in the first graph here, the lesion is probably not significant. Loss of incisura or loss of that wave is one of the first signs. So what is very important is your aortic tracing. Should have incisura, and your distal wire. If the lesion is significant, generally doesn't have incisura. The first change which comes is in the diastole, and then the change is both systole and diastolic. The widening of the graph is seen. So if you see the graph like this or this, that is where the lesion is likely to be significant. If you see the both the graphs coming down, the lesion is like likely to be. Uh, significant now you come to the uh, wire and uh, you have to cross the lesion and you have to make sure you are at the distal part of the uh, block now how distal should you be uh, there should not be any when you are doing ffr in ifr the rule may be a little different but if you are doing ffr your wire should be as distal as possible because if you have a lesion beyond the wire that's going to affect your ffr ffr is not simply additive ffr is more than that i'll show you a graph where you know where equation where how multiple lesion affect ffr so when you are doing a ffr make sure it is as distal as possible but not in a small branch it should be in the sizable main artery but as distal as possible also make sure that tip of your wire is in the main artery and not in a small branch so when it is in a small branch you get what you get you know especially if it is in a septal you get a lot of motion artifacts and your distal pressure starts jumping up and down if the wire moves the pressure tracing also moves so it's very important that it is in the main artery in a sizable position almost like your rota wire that you're not your distal comfortably distal but not in a small branch and not inside any of the artery then you get a bip dash uh, kind of effect now what are the agents used uh, time immemorial lots of agents have been used but they all have a very simple concept of uh, producing a distal vasodilatation contrast media itself is a vasodilator but the simple is distal vasodilatation but the common agents used are now adenosine papaverin is also used but the most common uh, agent used is adenosine so it's uh, enough to say that we use adenosine in most of the cases but there are other agents which could be used uh, a dose of adenosine if you are using iv if your lab is ready most uh, time if you are doing it very regularly it doesn't take much time for our people to get ready and start doing it uh, so 140 mics per kg per minute uh, most of the time most centers have a chart where if you, all you have to do is tell the weight of the patient to your uh, staff and they would do it then you could use uh, uh, that's the iv adenosine which is a uh, little expensive because you tend to use some boils of adenosine uh, but the advantage is uh, you will get a consistent results the errors are slightly lesser and if you are doing a pull back that's probably one only way to do is iv adenosine if you are using intracoronary adenosine it can be done and most of us do use intracoronary adenosine it's a very short acting drug uh, uh, and uh, uh, so the side effects are not really uh, to uh, too many uh, so when you are using intracoronary the dose varies if you are using on the right system it could be 80 to 100 mics on the left system it could go typically from 140 to 200 mics and 
you inject it quickly always make sure you give uh, nitrates in the beginning it's very important to give nitrates in the beginning but you don't have to repeat with each injection so give a nitrate make sure there is no spasm and your epicardial coronaries are dilated use adenosine to dilate your resistant vessel and make sure if the lesion is significant that's when the pressure falls if it is uh, it's also important to keep your hand and yourself off the table because as cardiologists we are very jittery moment you touch the table and keep think the pressure waveforms tend to vary it's important to start a denosin and stand back if it is iv if it is intra coronary then you need to give a denosin you need to flush it very fast which has to be done by the person who is working with you and then run the monitor see for maximum hyperemia and measure it now what do we see on the screen you see two uh, tracings and both the tracings have identical ffr first ffr is 0.76 the second is also 0.76 and if you are a believer of frame style this is something which you stand but look at the first graph first graph is actually because of the drift and not a real lesion because the green and the red actually look the same and you see a beautiful incisura even on the distal pressure which is green so the lesion it's not a true lesion this was actually a drip that's why it's very important for us to not to look at the number but look at the screen first the screen waveform identify and then uh, uh, then only you see the number whereas the second one if you see there is a systolo diastolic difference and the second wave actually does not have incisura the waveform is way different from what you see in the first and the second one is a true positive or 2.76 ffr first one is not so it's very important for us to you know look at the uh, images and not just the number and uh, uh, just see if there is a drift it is a problem of equalization you need to pull your wire back and equalize and get the this i want all of you to just concentrate on these two pictures and actually understand how the significant ffr looks it's not the number it is this graph which is extremely important for us to understand so uh, see the drift and uh, the pressure gradient so you look at this part of the graph it's because of the drift whereas if you look at this part of the graph it is because of ischemia so the wave form has to change the distal has to lose the incisura and the way it looks it looks as if like it's a ventricularized uh, whenever the lesion is significant initially you have a diastolic separation and later it looks ventricularized uh, this drift could be a physiological uh, uh, you know uh, drift up to 2 mm is acceptable but i think it's better not to have any drift if you think there is a drift pull it to, uh, <coughs> to the guiding catheter bring it back and again equalize <coughs> pull back is extremely important and uh, ifr if you are using ifr or rfr probably it's done very easily with the uh, uh, pull back but it's also uh, it can be done with the uh, ffr but do not you cannot do it with the uh, i uh, intra coronary uh, adenosine you have to do it with the uh, iv adenosine also if possible it's important for us to learn to look at the screen itself this is nothing but the pressure form which is now in a um, the, where the speed is decreased and uh, you know you could see the ffr charts which are uh, uh, present in the left side you could uh, you realize that the green is actually low uh, in this and as they are trying to pull up at this point when it reaches the guide it equalizes and then the machine gives you the distal most ffr so if you are pulling up you know that this is the mean the red is the mean of iota green is the mean of the distal wire and here they have labeled it it's, it's coming from the led to uh, ostial led to the left main so we realize that the block is actually between middle led to proximal led and not at uh, left main position pull back is uh, something which is very interesting and it's very useful when we look at uh, multiple blocks it's very useful to look at uh, identify which of the block is um, uh, significant uh, and uh, we have some examples of that which is uh, which is here so you realize that uh, 
uh, the digital pressure is actually low. As you pull up, you can have a step up and you could look at that step up change. For example, in this example, the, uh, the distal to proximal, the pullback, the pressure gradient was 22. And prox there is still some residual stenosis even in proximal uh, uh, lesions. So there are some, based on the pullback, there are uh, 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 there is definition for a diffuse block and a focal block. If a pullback produces more than 10 millimeter jump in the pressure, then it's called focal. But if the jump is gradual, and, uh, one, two, three millimeter, uh, and uh, uh, and if it lasts for more than 10 millimeter in in length, then then it's called the diffuse uh, block. Uh, when you pull back to the guide, look for the drift. Drift could be in both directions. So, like for example, in this example, when the catheter was finally in, the, when the wire was finally in catheter, uh, the PD, uh, uh, PD by uh, it was 0.91. There is a drift, so this cannot be accepted. Even if the FFR comes positive here, if the distal FFR was say 0.7. And when you pull it back to the guiding catheter, you're still getting 0 0.1, 0 0.9. Then it's not a significant FFR. You have to make sure that you recalibrate or equalize or normalize. Go back again. Because actually, that would have been 0 0.7 to 0 0.9. would actually be 0 0.8 to 1. So it's very important that when you finally pull back the wire to IOTA, which is the guiding catheter here, you should make sure that the PT by PA is 1. So it's a lot of work when you do FFR and artifacts are very common and it's especially much more common when we reuse the wire. It's very difficult. It takes a lot of time. Sometimes it looks it's much easier to stent a lesion than actually do FFR. And uh, so, but do it properly for uh, for the best uh, this. So artifacts are a lot. Hemodynamic artifacts we did discuss. If you are guiding <coughs> In the pressure, it's not reliable again, especially if you're doing with a osteal lesion. If you use a side hole uh, uh, in an osteal stenosis, again, you will get a pseudo stenosis. Technical aspects are very important. Loose connections are proper, uh, calibration, zeroing, comparing the value before and after, making sure that when you pull it back, there is no drift, making sure there is no uh, drift initially is uh, important. Sometimes anatomically, tortuosity is a big problem. Imagine if your wire is impacted in one of the small artery, you get a lot of artifacts. It's also possible you do not produce adequate hyperemia, that the value is significant, but you're not actually produce the hyperemia, and that's why it is uh, problematic. Now look at this uh, example where the guide is out of ostia and there is FFR. Uh, Tracing. If you see in the beginning, the first four reading, it's actually a significant lesion. The reason being that the aortic waveform, which has come through the guide, is good. The distal wire actually shows almost like a venter. You don't see an incisura, you see a flat distal wire. But by mistake, if there was an osteal lesion or an osteal spasm, and you take your guide in and your guide is engaged, this is the tracing you get, the which is, which is there in the last four. And you will falsely report it as a normal FFR and not a significant FFR because the waveform here match. So it's very important for us to make sure your guide is not damned while in the right position, and you are actually looking at both the tracings. Now, impact of guide size, if you take a very big size, guide size, then it is again problematic because in a, in a smaller RCA or a diseased left main, the guide itself will impact and bring the whole ventricular is the whole pressure the wire does not show a further decrease in the pressure and it, it is difficult so guide with side holes probably should not be used for ffr at all the reason being that you could be damping the artery without you knowing like like the last example <coughs> last example it was a non-side hole guide hole catheter that's why you know it imagine your guide damps it and you don't realize then uh, uh, then you will get a false high or a false low ffr so you, uh, we should not use now uh, some of the things where do you get a, a ffr which is negative but a lesion is apparently more significant 
that could happen truly if the lesion is not significant or the territory is very small and it is not viable or you have a severe microvascular disease like in case of acute MI and this is uh, acute MI shortly like in culprit lesion especially in STMI you could get a false negative FFR that means FFR is actually positive but you could get a false negative FFR Take, there are technical reasons for that which includes the drift wrong equalization or equalization with needle insufficient hyperemia especially you're, when you're using intracoronary uh, guiding catheter which has multiple hole which is deep engaged so two three points if you want to make it um, the first one is a physiological explanation they are true so acute mi i will discuss that shortly we cannot do it in certain period of time which we'll discuss but avoid technical reason make sure you use the appropriate guide without side hole without and you look for drift and look for equal uh, you have done right equalization Do not use the too big a guide you use the appropriate guide and make sure that guide pressure is a true aortic pressure and distal pressure is a true distal pressure ffr does have a ESC recommendation as class A for in a stable heart disease for intermediate lesion. It makes sense that we use FFR most of the time in our clinical practice, especially when we have a doubt about a, a lesion. So let me quickly cover the, uh, you know, uh, uh, some uh, special scenarios. One is the osteal uh, lesion. If you have osteal lesion and if you are using intracoronary, equalize inside the guide and not outside because the lesion is in osteal it could be left main osteal left main uh, or it could be rc osteal make sure you are, you, you are equalizing inside now pass the wire distally at that time if you are giving intracoronary adenosine you have to hook and then give intracoronary adenosine and after you do that pull back the guide again and then only measure if your guide is damping the lesion FFR will be false negative, means it's a true FFR, a positive FFR, but we get negative. So key point, equalize in the guide catheter, engage, give the drug, disengage, look at the, uh, the monitor for the right uh, measurement and measure FFR. Now, this is how it looks. This was the guide which was engaged and when it's engaged, the FFR looks normal. But when you disengage the guy, you re realize that the distal pressure was actually low. Again, trick is to identify an incisura. If you have don't see incisura in iota, there's something wrong. You have damped the artery with the incisura. You should not. You should have, always have an incisura in aortic tracing, and most of the time, you should not have incisura in a significant distal uh, uh, block. Collateralized vessel is one more uh, scar and collateralized behaves in the opposite direction. Uh, if you have a scar, FFR will come higher and that also it gives, tells us that you don't have to send this lesion. So you have a say, delayed presentation of anterior oral MI where you're thinking 50% of the myocardium is gone, but the lesion looks 90%. Do FFR. FFR positive, you are justified in stenting. FFR negative, you could just rule. Although it is not a test for viability, it just tell us, tells us that uh, benefit could be higher. <coughs> if it's a collateralized area, then your FFR, if the artery is collateralized, the lesser lesion could become FFR positive. For example, you have LAD, which is 60, but RCA is a CTO. FFR in LAD could come positive because now the artery is actually supplying LAD, also significant amount of RCA. So only way to do it is repeat it after you open up the RCA. Otherwise, there's no way to be sure whether it is useful, uh, you know, whether it was because of, it's a true FFR, it's not a false FFR, but the FFR is positive because it is supplying one more uh, territory. So the key message is FFR depends on perfusion territory scar less viable myocardium ffr is likely to be negative even though the lesion looks significant if it is a big territory like a proximal lad or left main or when lad is collateralizing rca lesion might look 50 but the ffr could be uh, positive 
Now, uh, other important is acute coronary syndrome. What do we do to FFR? Because that's one area where uh, it looks, uh, sometimes we have 60-70% blocks and we have here. acute STMI, first five days, FFR is of no value. When I say no value, if it is negative, it is of no value. If it is positive, even in those first five days, it, it, is, it is important and it needs to be strengthened. So negative FFR in first five days is of no value. In acute STMI, uh, positive does have a value. When you talk about non-STMI or unstable angina, you could do FFR in non-STMI unstable angina. This was the NEGM trial which got that five days uh, as a cutoff. So it's okay to do FFR in STMI in the culprit artery after five days. Non-culprit artery, you could easily do it. If it is NST ACS or unstable angina, you can do it. There was a sub-study of FAME which showed that if you are doing it in unstable angina or NSTMI, there's no problem. You could use FFR. So only rule is STMI first five days and negative FFR does not have a role, whereas positive has role. Now, what do we do for serial lesion? This is something I think which we uh, see very frequently because uh, coronaries are not as pristine as we want them to be. Almost always there are one or two lesions. So now here there are actually, there are, see uh, the example which is quoted, there is a block which is A and there is block which is B. So you could have a proximal, mid and distal. There are three pressures. But unfortunately, you just can't add. This is the formula. If you say anybody wants to buy heart it, this is the formula which tells us how to predict the FFR of proximal and negative. My purpose of putting this slide is to tell that we have taken medicine because we didn't like physics. So doing this formula is extremely difficult and nearly impossible for all of us. So it's how do we do it? So if there is a multiple lesion, first pass the wire to distal most lesion. We go as distant as possible. Do a FFR. You have two lesions, but you do a FFR at the distal most point. Key, key message is you can't do FFR in between. Uh, in between FFR, imagine you see there is a block A and block B and you want to position the wire in between. It's not useful at all because the distal lesion does affect the hemodynamic even if you keep the wire in middle. So in FFR, you can't keep it in the middle. Only thing what you can do is take it to distal most region and do a FFR. If the FFR is more than 0.8, it's very simple. That means both these lesions combined are not significant. Hence, even individually, they are not significant. So if the FFR is normal or 0 0.80, you could just forget it and both the lesions are not significant. The problem comes if FFR is less than 0.8. That means lesion is significant. Now, there are two possibilities. Either both of them are significant or only one of them is significant. So that is an important decision because that tells us whether we need to stand both the arteries or we need to stand one of the arteries. So to uh, do that, as I told you, cannot keep a FFR in the middle. So for example, here in the tandem lesion, the proximal FFR was 0 0.90. The distal is 0 0.65. Middle is 0 0.82. That does not mean stenosis A is not significant. Only B is significant. That means either of them could be significant. Now, what do we do when that happens? Uh, if we need to look at delta change in pressure gradient. That means at this point, we need to see the, uh, we need to use IV adenosine and not intracoronary adenosine and start pulling the wire from distal to proximal. See which point the pressure rises highest. That's, that's very important. Imagine the distal was 0.6 and proximal is uh, uh, beyond is 9. If the pressure change between the distal point is a 12 millimeter, and pressure change between the proximal point is 10 millimeter, then we know the distal is more significant than proximal. In this case, we need to fix the distal and do the proximal. This is just the formula to tell us that we can't do it. So you fix the distal and do the proximal. Uh, so whichever has a maximum pressure difference, that is the one we fix first. Do repeat FFR and then 
do the uh, uh, do the uh, this. So the point key point do not keep the wire in between. It doesn't help us at all. You need to keep the wire way distant. Then you get one delta p that you know from here to here mean rise in FFR and second delta p across the second lesion. See whether the delta P2 is bigger or P1 is bigger. Whichever is bigger, you treat that first. So in the example here, the delta P1 was 12 millimeter and delta P2 was 30 millimeter because change in pressure. This is got by IV adenosine and V gradually pulling the FFR wire proximal. So whichever is higher, you do that first. So in this case, we need to treat the distal lesion redo the FFR. Sometimes the FFR comes negative when you redo it, in which case you are done. If FFR is positive again, you need to do the proximal one. So diffuse disease, again, you do the pullback, find the most, culp you know, the areas of culprit and it tells you uh, from which point to which point the FFR is significant and we need to treat it. Bypass graft, uh, uh, so I think the key is this bypass graft. If there are lesions, position it, go through the PQ artery, position it way beyond the graft if possible, or if it is in the graft, go through both the lesions and position. If it is a negative FFR, you can just uh, uh, forget it. That's how you do a bypass graft. I just want to highlight one or two other points, I think, because I've already taken. Uh, nearly 45 minutes so uh, i think beyond this we could probably discuss because it will be too much talking so chf and as lvs this is just one point ffr does not behave like common sense sometimes that's the point i want to make if you have a person with say aortic stenosis or lvs we think that lv is big so the ffr will be false positive it's not true. It will be other way. You will miss the FFR. Reason being, as the LVEDP rises, the PD, the distal pressure, gets affected. So FFR becomes falsely high if you have hypertension or if you have AS. Just because there is a large muscle mass here, FFR actually does not become false positive. It actually becomes false negative. So example here, AS patient, FFR was negative, but post RV. FFR becomes, uh, sorry, uh, becomes positive because post RV you have relieved that LV EDP and uh, hence the FFR actually becomes positive, it becomes more significant, appears more significant post RV. So LVH does have effect. So there are too many things which, uh, which uh, do affect FFR. So uh, it's very important we see it. Side branch FFR is one more very important, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing because the side branch is uh, is what we do because most of our intervention do have a side branch at some time very sizable side branch like a large diagonal, large OM or a circumflex. One way to do it is if, you know, when you're doing a left main strength, you could keep a FFR wire in the side branch and jail it, you know. When you're doing an intervention, you could keep the FFR wire in any of the side branch, jail it, post tenting, measure the FFR in that artery. And if the FFR is less, only then intervene. That's one easy way of doing when you jail the FFR wire in the side branch. And you may be able to, uh, if you do that, even though the lesion looks 90%, and if the uh, if the flow is TV3, your chance of size branch becoming significant is only 27%. So you could avoid stenting the side branch in three-fourths of the cases and prevent uh, uh, oculostenotic reflex in a side branch and there's uh, there are data to show that if you leave a FFR in a side branch and the, if the FFR is uh, uh, normal which is more than 0.8 then the recurrent events are much lesser. Doing in left main is one more tricky thing but it's something which we need to do because left main is one artery which is very notorious angiographic correlation of left main to uh, stenosis or to IVAS is extremely critical. Probably no, no two cardiologists will ever agree on a left main stenosis and different numbers are always told. It's very important to do FFR in left main 
the cutoff is same. Most of the time, you need to, you know, point eight uh, uh, zero is the cutoff, which is uh, which is which is used. But it is little complex because you need to do FFR to both the arteries, both LAD and L6. See, in this case, the bronch is only in left main. Hence, FFR is simple to do. What do we do? We need to do FFR both to LAD and circumflex. If either of them is significant, then left main is significant. The rule is either. The lesion only in left main, either of the arteries is significant, left main is significant. The problem comes when there is additional lesion in one more artery, like LAD in this case. So we believe, I mean, the common sense tells us that if you do L6 FFR, it is enough. But uh, unfortunately, it is not that simple because LAD lesions do impact the FFR of L6, especially if they are in, you know, if they are in uh, osteal or proximal position, and especially if they are significant. A significant LAD might make a L6 FFR negative. So if you have a lesion like this, it's very important for us to treat that LAD and then reassess the FFR. So downstream, oh, sorry, yes. Sorry to interrupt. We have another talk. So yes, yes. I can stop here. Yes. No, no. You can conclude so that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So to conclude, remember that downstream left main uh, stenosis does affect uh, uh, the left main in presence of a proximal severe stenosis of either of the branch. Left main is likely to be underestimated, not over underestimated so uh, it's important treat the side branches if they are significant and only then do ffr if it is only left to me it's much simpler but remember osteal LADs tend to under report the left main stenosis okay so to conclude i think what we'll do is i'll not take ifr at all if there is a discussion we can do to conclude i think two three important messages is uh, Technique of it's a very sensitive thing, so number is not important. Doing it right is very important. Equalize very frequently. Make sure pressures are zero. Most of the uh, pressures are, uh, you know, equalize zero. Equalize it in the uh, outside the guide as much as possible. Use the appropriate guide size and do not have a side, uh, you know, side hole guide. Do not put your introducer needle through the uh, uh, the catheter. Anytime, uh, do not do that. Introducer needle should be strictly off, and then use an appropriate agent and produce a good hyperemia. The pitfalls are when there are multiple lesions. Measure the delta p. Treat the most delta p first. If it is equal, treat the distal, not the proximal distal that is what you should understand in between ffr is just not possible it has to be at the end uh, pull back does have a lot of value most important is look at the graph yourself don't go by the number iota should always have a beautiful tracing with the incisura distal block most of the time initially it is only diastolic separation but if it is really significant if the graphs are widening the distal will not have the incisura and the ffr will be positive yeah with that i think i will uh, um, stop my uh, talk and i'm open to question uh, um, thank you dr anjan it's always a uh, pleasure to listen to you or uh, do cases with you i'll yeah. just quickly uh, have the questions one one was raised by dr sudhe how many cardiologists do ffr uh, in their cases for their cases for their cases i think the answer would be 3 to 5% if i have to guess it right so it's a small number of cardiologists but I think uh, uh, it's an important modality, and uh, with uh, uh, with now many companies coming with FFR and the cost of the machine not being very high, I'm sure most people would like to use FFR now. Actually, Dr. Subdev's questions are always the toughest. So, <laughs> uh, can I ask Manuria, sir? There, there is a question again asked in presence of collaterals. And low FFR, is this justifiable to uh, defer stenting? If the, if is the collateral and the FFR is normal, it is. you mean, imagine there is a RCA which is collateralized, 
and you uh, do a FFR and the FFR value comes is normal, more than 0.8, it's justified to leave it, provided you believe in that collateral is, uh, is fine. But a low, uh, low FFR needs to be treated even in presence of collateral. But if this artery is supplying one more artery, that's a difficult uh, uh, thing to deal with. If Can I ask one question? Collateralized, it's good. Can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Sure. When, when do you prefer IFR and when do you prefer FFR and what is the current status of CT FFR? Yeah, yeah. I think this is an excellent question. Unfortunately, I got so stuck up with FFR, I couldn't talk about IFR. If I'm given a choice, I would use IFR all the time and not FFR if I'm given a choice. So the reason being IFR is much easier to do and it is not really affected by multiple problems. The problems which we discussed of serial lesion, left main, one more lesion affecting one more, all those do not ex agree with the IFR. I think if Dr. Smith is kind, we'll have one special IFR talk someday. Just IFR, okay, absolutely no IFR on that. In-house thing, whenever you wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will do IFR. The advantage of IFR is, you know, initially there was something called a gray zone in IFR, which was 0.86 to 0.93. Now, if you see present literature, there's no gray zone. It's 0.89. There's only one cutoff, which is 0.89. And IFR, the beauty of it is you cross a lesion, you know the IFR across that lesion. And the pullback can be done easily. So you can even do virtual stenting. You know, you have pulled back and you realize IFR, delta IFR is now 0 0.10, 0 0.11. You exactly know what IFR gain you can produce. So if somebody has RFR or IFR, so-called resting indices, all resting indices have one cutoff. That's 0 0.89. There's no two, three cutoffs. There's only one cutoff. It is as good as IFR, FFR as far as data is concerned. If you have it, uh, use it more often. I do it very often. And to answer Dr. Sukhdev's question, I think only 0.1% of cardiologists will have IFR. The number is much smaller. But if you have it, use it. Yeah. Secondly, uh, severe microvascular disease could affect FFR, as you said. Yes. Diabetics yes. often have severe uh, microvascular disease. So what I suggested when you are getting an angiogram, the flow is very slow. This is an indirect evidence you are having a microvascular disease and you should be cautious in interpreting the results of FFR. FFR. Yeah, it, it does affect, sir, but the, what, what we know from the studies is it's only the acute MI, which is first five days, uh, which is effective. We are not sure whether the slow flow, which we see in most scenario, affects uh, FFR. People have not really done study on that. That's one interesting area where, you know, all of us from BJ could actually get together, maybe do around 100 to 250 cases of just slow flow and see, you know, no objective stenosis, slow flow and see the effect of that on FFR, you know, especially if it is positive. Now, we say that studies have shown that you may have only CFR affected and the microvascular disease is diagnosed. There are four subsets. Correct, correct. Correct. Very commonly picks up this microvascular disease very specifically. Correct. The problem with the FFR is FFR comes falsely high in these cases. It doesn't go low. When you have microvascular disease, it comes high. So since there is no lesion anyway, so the stenting question doesn't arise. It doesn't make it low. It actually makes it high when you have a microvascular disease. Yeah. Uh, Manoria, sir, there is another question from uh, one of our junior that... Uh, uh, how do we assess that it is adequate hyperemia? Sometimes yes. even after adenosine, there is no uh, heart blocks or no slowing uh, scene. The, how do we assess that it is complete hyperemia? And now we can be rest assured that we can go ahead with that. We test. can better answer it. So anyone can. Anybody wants to answer that? I'm I'm okay you with can answer it. <laughs> Yeah. So the answer to that is what we know is that uh, so complete heart block is not needed at all to produce. Uh, it's not a sign of uh, vascular effect of adenosine. The, that's a different receptor and this is a different receptor. So it's a, it's a difficult question. What we know is in majority of people using the dose which is recommended does produce a maximum hyperemia. Uh, adenosine is something, you know, it's very potent as far as a coronary vasodilatation is concerned. 
and it does produce five times um, higher coronary blood flow from baseline. So it's as effective as exercise, much more than dobutamine. And adenosine is something which is almost always used in nuclear uh, stress studies. Uh, to produce ischemia. So from that data and from the data of FFR, what we have, if you use the reasonable dose, which is pretty high, that should be sufficient to produce hyperemia. But you don't need complete heart block to prove that. Uh, since you bought complete heart block, I want to tell one more thing. When you have complete heart block, do not measure FFR during those beats. It's wrong. It's not correct. You'll get a value. It is not correct. You'll still have to wait for it to reverse yeah. and then then you know look at the graph and then measure you cannot be doing when there is a lot of hemodynamic you know patient is crashing and you're doing ffr on one side doesn't work at all you need to have hemodynamic stability to have ffr to be measured yeah i think that is why dr sarath can not talk also yes sir i would that's what I, if dr pranav allows then we'll go to the second talk so that and rest of the questions can be asked on whatsapp group also Nice talk. I invite uh, Dr. Sharad Chandra to join the with his presentation. The questions can be discussed on uh, WhatsApp group. They can be typed, and Dr. Ranjan would be ready to answer these. And one more thing that all these uh, presentations they'll be uploaded on uh, uh, on uh, youtube channel of pgi cardiology so there is a special there is a limited channel which is which will be open to us members only and these talks every as they happen they'll be uploaded there uh, samir can you help dr shara chandra to up, uh, start presentation yeah are you able to hear me yes sir loud and clear sir so we are switching off our mic and you can continue sir. Yeah, you know, just one moment, because uh, this is also a fairly lengthy talk. Uh, I am okay if uh, you are all ready to, uh, you know, spend so much time, it's 9 p.m. I have no problem. Uh, and let me compliment Ranjan. It's a fantastic talk, you know. I had quite a few people speaking on FFR. I think you made it really, really uh, crystal clear, almost like opening a banana and putting it in another fellow's mouth. Fantastic, uh, Ranjan. I Thank hope I, my talk will match uh, your talk in clarity. Okay. So, you know, uh, this is, of course, a completely different talk. LDLC beyond statics. I'm sure Dr. Manoria uh, loves this subject. I heard it so many yes. times. And uh, let us start with this. And uh, yeah, let, let me put it in. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, the... LDL cholesterol is the culprit in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Uh, we know that it is now an established fact. Uh, there were some confusions in the past, but no longer now. Uh, it is proven from animal studies, the randomized controlled clinical trials, familial hypercholesterolemia, Mendelian randomization studies, epidemiological studies, ultimately atherosclerosis to one important molecule that is LDL. And you can see here, that uh, it is suggesting that I am not able to see slides. I am not able to see slides. slides. Sir, the slide. I am not able to see slides. Slides are not slide. No slide. One second. Uh, why is that? Uh, only one slide you couldn't see, or all these slides uh, three, no four slide. you missed. No slides no slide seen. Shared item will be displayed only. That okay. is okay. Uh, how yeah. is it possible that only? Uh, Dr. Ranjan, meanwhile, you can see the chat and uh, uh, see the questions they have asked. Dr. Ranjan. So, I think I'm seeing some questions. Is this but is the, sir? You can no. type, type the answers. No, no. Okay. You have not shared. Uh, no. Uh, then how did we first slide then? One second. Have you uploaded uh, it? Have you uploaded it or you have not uploaded it? Or directly sharing? Samir, can you no, help? No, no. No. No, we checked it earlier and he said, okay, uh, let me go to this share screen. Yeah, now it may be visible. The screen uh, is moving. Now do we... Okay. 
How about it now, sir? Now it is under process. Slide. Screen is loading. Okay. Screen is loading. Slides have not yet come. So we checked it before. No, it must, start you, must be having, you are having many slides. That's why it's taking time. Your PPT is big. That's no, why it's taking time. Uh, we are not uh, loading the slides. Uh, Samir, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there, sir. Uh, the screen is loading. Just take two minutes. Yeah, what is the issue now? Are you able to see the slide or not? No. It will come, sir. No. Within one minute or two minutes, it will come. Samir. Yeah, 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 sir. I can hear you. Within one minute or two minutes, it will come, sir. Ah. Don't be like that. 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 You can directly share, no? Share the screen directly. Yes, sir, I have done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is no, that only. Then why the, the internet connection? It will, uh, it will take time. Screen loading error. Samir, is there anything I can do from my end? Uh, sir, can you able to go to the storage and upload this slide? It will be fast. One second. Go to the storage. Yeah, can your voice also is not clearly audible. Okay. Right can now it is audible. louder. Yeah, yeah. Right now it is audible, sir. Yeah, now now you are audible. Yes. Yeah. Go to the storage. Tell me what I what I should do. Yeah, go to the upload go file. To what? Suddenly your voice is going down again. Hello. Um, yeah. Where do we get it? Storage. Because uh, go to the uh, I can go to the plus uh, plus sign at the left side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Upload the files. Go to the storage and upload the file. How big is the file, sir? Um, How many MB? Um, I can't say that now. There are quite a few slides. No, once again, let me just tell me what I should do now. Under the plus sign, you have uh, this storage. You have under the storage. Yeah. Go to the upload yeah, file. Okay. Right in now, what do you do? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Upload file. Okay. One second. One second. I think I'll have to close these uh, slides. Yeah. One moment, eh? Upload for you. Sir, your PPT seems to be heavy. You can split in two, but then I don't know. No, no, it's okay, sir. It will not be that. That will not be the problem. I am just trying to get this done. Just give me one moment.
sir while it is being done i can uh, i thank uh, almost uh, our alumni group has grown from 72 to 91 today and uh, most of uh, uh, the i think 2000 plus uh, year plus most of the fellows are here it is uh, initial 10 15 years that uh, we do not have a See, DM started, doctor, in seventy-three, seventy-four. Sir. PGI. First Sir. batch was seventy-three, seventy-four. Sir. Mahapatra. Are you getting uh, this? So, uh, I have okay. is, is it possible we can connect to them? We can connect to the seventy-three, seventy-four, and then. Asamir. Yes, sir. Uh, have you got them? Yeah, yeah I am there, sir. Uh, so far, I can't see any slides. Uh, are you uploading such slides? Because I can't able to see here that. It is all done. It shows hundred percent. It shows. It shows. No, we are not seeing. LDA. We are seeing. No, 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 no. No. Uh, did you get the slides? You said upload it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here, so far, I have not received, sir. it is the common platform where i what it is showing here uh, there sir we have seen shows that uh, uploading is over uploading is over what shows uploading is over okay a uh, presentation name Sorry? what is the name name is uh, ldlc beyond statistics Uploading is over, so you should have got it by now. Mm. You know, I check. You could see the slides. Why should you be seeing now from my laptop? You do one thing. We check uh, this. One second, you try sir the sharing screen, share screen. Just share click screen. Click on this plus. Yeah, plus sign. Click on the share screen. No, one second. That's not coming now. You have to go back. Oh, okay. Once again, I will disconnect and reconnect again. That is simple. Is there a problem, sir? Yeah. Sir, the next class we are planning is on six uh, June, sir. Saturday again at uh, same time, evening eight, and the topic is uh, fetal echocardiogram. because that is something most of the uh, members they insisted that they, they have uh, not touched upon even and any other topic that uh, we can have probably we can uh, suggest in the whatsapp and we can plan and in fact i i like to have uh, speakers good speakers who can uh, take up pick up those topics and uh, Since we have Dr. Manoria sir, we we must be utilizing him to the fullest. The fetal echocardiography, <laughs> not a topic for him. Sir, other other topics. Ah, other topics. Yes. So you can suggest few topics which ah, can be of interest. The basic idea is that they should not be like yeah. uh, pharmaceutical driven yeah. webinars. It should be something which you use in the next day practice. Yeah. In the meantime, you can have questions from the audience for LDL. Yes. yes. Uh, now it will. Uh... I think so. Yeah, sir is here. Your screen. Uh, I can see, sir, your screen share. Kindly open the presentation. And I request Ranjan sir to note the question so that uh, he can. Answer them at, at in the WhatsApp at his leisure. There are good many questions that have been raised. So my professor in medicine used to say, ah, "Now it is visible. Slides, yeah. slides are visible. If your talk raises too many questions, that you have delivered it good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now they are visible. Doctor Sarath, now slides are visible. Uh, sir, uh, you are also requested to hide the. Uh, bottom bar that says uh, hide. 
that was uh, troubling the audience before. Yeah, this is this. And we'll switch off the mics now, sir. Thank you. I think Dr. Sharad Chandra is too big a personality, so it is either him or his slides which will be visible. Let him begin the talk. Now you can stop, uh, start the talk. Ne? Okay. Ha, 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 ha. So what do we do? We, 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 yeah. Or uh, we postpone the talk to the next time if, because his topic is also long and important. So just ask him if. Uh, yeah, because of, we are all, it would be justified that we listen in half and what no use. Now slides are visible, no? Sir, I think he got disconnected. He dis got disconnected oh, yeah. and has, he has switched off his phone. Okay. So, if I don't know if, if we can connect him, then maybe we can have the same talk in the next week, uh, next Saturday or like. Meanwhile, I think uh, doctor, we can milk Dr. Ranjan more. There are a lot yeah. many questions. FFR yeah. in AF, frequent PVC. Yes. Uh, FFR in low hematocrit. Yes. I was I was hoping I could escape most of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> There's no choice. So I think in a when we talk about AF and uh, PVC, it, it's possible to do FFR. It's not impossible because what FFR does is it looks at to beat variation in hyperemia, and we can do it. Yeah. Ask the others. One second. Okay. No, you be there and please be careful uh, when you give the advice. I'm sure because you are an expert, but I have also given many many talks in the last 45 days. Uh, so one second. Let me ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Manoria, are you able to hear me? Yes. I am able to hear you, but Shall not this night. As you wish. No, no. Uh, yeah, no, no. Yeah, earlier you said slides are visible. Ha, but now they are not. See, no? We have not switched yes. off the slides. One second. Uh, is the slide visible now? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Visible. Slides are visible, and I am yes. seen there or not? Your okay. voice is so there, no please problem. Tell me, shall be visible, visible. No, no, no. But what he is saying is everything is okay now. Okay now. Yes. 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 So, uh, shall we go ahead with the talk now, or you want to reschedule it? I think you will go ahead, no problem. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, Sami uh, Srivatsav, shall we go ahead with the talk? Sir, uh, as Dr. Manoria, we are not hearing sir. anybody else. Why? As Manoria, okay. sir, please. Sir. So, we will go ahead with this talk. I am just here to uh, okay. something like that. So, like, uh, you are able. To... Yeah. Are you able to see this slide on forests, uh, uh, yes, lipid, etc.? Yes. yes sir. Okay. Okay, this we have already spoke. Okay. Uh, now, 
this is a uh, meta analysis uh, uh, looking at the data from a huge number of patients 170000 participants in 26 trials and uh, the top um, row shows that uh, it's a comparison between statin versus placebo and uh, demonstrated clearly that uh, there is a reduction in non fatal mi cardiovascular death coronary revascularization and ischemic stroke there is a sizable fall here because it's comparison with uh, placebo the lower uh, row shows comparison between high versus uh, moderate intensity statin and here you can see that uh, once again there is a significant reduction in most of these uh, parameters so it is now clear that from this meta analysis once again that reduction of uh, ldl by using statin therapy is highly useful and beneficial for the patient in this uh, uh, slide it shows that ldl lower is better it is not just that you give ldl and reduce the ldl uh, you give the statin and reduce the ldl to a certain extent um, but further you reduce greater the benefit see here the 4s has shown some benefit some some reduction of ldl but when you come to the later day trials like tnt trial which compared uh, 80 milligram at with 10 milligram the benefit is even greater so it is clear that uh, when you use weaker doses of statins and the more powerful statins the original statins were relatively weaker statins like simwa but uh, the currently used statins like atarva and rosva statin they bring down the ldl much more and in those trials the figures have even improved and we have now come to single digit uh, digit figures here you can see uh, that in addition uh, clinical events reduction there is an improvement in the percent thromba volume in uh, while doing iva studies there are so many studies here reversal camelot activate reversal uh, uh, asteroid trial all of them we had many asteroid trial which used Rosua statin, not only there is a reduced progression, in fact, there is regression of a thromba volume. So you use more powerful statins, bring down the LDL greater, you can even not only demonstrate clinical events improvement, you can demonstrate a reduction of a thromba volume. Statins were the first line pharmacotherapy in the management of dyslipidemia India for uh, secondary prevention of events as well as for primary prevention. They are safe and effective but there are some limitations to starting therapy so what are the limitations there is most importantly residual risk what is residual risk we all know that uh, compared to placebo there is an improvement when you use the statins but still there are certain events so that is what is implied as by saying residual risk there is of course sometimes you, have, you use statins there is not much improvement that is statin resistance there can be static intolerance. This intolerance can be total intolerance. Patient develops so much muscle symptoms that the LDL, uh, the patient does not continue the medication. And sometimes he will not tolerate high doses. He is okay to use relatively lower doses. So that is another issue. And inability to achieve LDLC goals by using statins, yet you are not achieving the goal and you would like to reduce the LDL further. You want to, uh, yes. And familial hypercholesterolemia is another area where statins can have loss. Now you can see here the relatively recent trials, the TNT trial, which used 10 milligrams to 80 milligrams, showing that intensive uh, therapy has brought down uh, LDL significantly. And you can see here particularly that the, they are now single digit figures. The event rates have come down significantly. The same is seen in Pruitt and IDL trials. Now, when you go to this slide, it shows that today, of course, the uh, there are situations which are called very high risk. Actually, although they are called very high risk, I'm implying that these are uncommon, but in Indian setup, these are very common. Acute coronary syndrome, chronic coronary syndrome, coronary devascularization relatively recently, stroke, TIA, peripheral vascular disease, so many things. And all these situations, these are very high risk patients. And uh, Lipid Association of India recommends uh, LDL less than 50. ESC recommends LDL less than 55 in this. And if there is a second vascular event within the uh, last two years, LDL should be reduced to less than 40. So this is the emphasis today that we know LDL is responsible. We know the greater the reduction of LDL, greater the benefit. And statists are not able to uh, achieve these targets in all the situations. There are many situations wherein statins cannot be used to 
the extent we would like to use or the patient is just not able to tolerate it or not responding to LDL. So we need to look at areas where we would like to bring in other agents which can help the patient uh, to bring down the LDL further so that he gets maximum benefit from LDL lowering therapy. Need to look beyond statins. But there are so many agents that have come. We are going to discuss a few of them. HGMI, PCSK9 inhibitors, which of course is the main thing in this talk. And then Inclisiron, which is also a PCSK9 inhibitor, but working by a different mechanism, Bempedoic acid, others. Now, HGMI. HGMI, uh, one of the, uh, this is one of the first non-statin drugs that showed by adding it to statin that there is further improvement in LDL levels and improvement in reduction of uh, events. Uh, this is uh, using the HGMI over and above the statin. You can see here what they have done. They compared a combination of uh, simvastatin 40 milligrams along with HGMI 10 milligrams and compared it to simvastatin 40 milligrams. Simvastatin in today's uh, situation, we would say this is a relatively weak statin. But at that point, they chose this uh, drug to use the HGMI. Probably they thought that Atarva or Rosua would have come in a big way and bring down the uh, LDL level so much that HDMI may not make a difference. Probably that's the right way to do. And you can see here that uh, they followed up these patients for two and a half years. And uh, you can see that the uh, combination therapy has brought down the LDL much more significantly than simvastatin alone. And the simvastatin arm LDLC was about 70 milligrams with HDMI simvastatin combination. It was 53 milligrams. This is a significant difference and brought down the LDL levels to something like 50, which was not there in the earlier trials. And this showed that there is further benefit by using this combination therapy in terms of primary endpoint. And uh, uh, there is a 32% uh, uh, in, in event rate in the combination therapy, but it is 34% with the uh, single simvastatin therapy. And uh, you can see here the a uh, combination of CV death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke also showed significant reduction. And uh, there is no additional uh, evidence of any side effects by bringing down the LDL to a lower level. And uh, you can see uh, this is a brief way of uh, showing the improved uh, trial. And in patients with high risk ACS, HDMI 10 milligrams in combination with 40 milligrams in mastatin, the superior to simvastatin 40 milligrams alone in reducing adverse CV events. And this is the first study powered by clinical outcomes to show a benefit with a non-statin agent. And the important point here is it has given the feeling that lower is better. It is not enough here to just bring down the LDL. Further you bring down, greater the benefit. And uh, conclusions, as I said, uh, non-statin lowering LDL, yes, it brings down more benefit. Even lower LDL, yes, it is beneficial. And it confirms, of course, the combination of the um, HDMI uh, statin in terms of safety. Reaffirms the LDL hypothesis that reducing LDLC prevents cardiovascular events. Now, PCSK9 inhibitors naturally form a very important part of this drug, and uh, there are two agents which are uh, currently clinically being used: ivolokumab, elnokumab. In India, what we have is ivolokumab. Although uh, not too many patients have got it occurred as per the uh, you know data we have, but still uh, internationally we have so much data. Look at uh, the most important trial in relation to ivolokumab, that is the Fourier trial. Lots have been spoken and written about the Fourier trial. It randomized 27,000 patients, 27,000 plus patients who had established cardiovascular disease, either myocardial infarction or stroke or symptomatic peripheral artery disease. Its competitive molecule. Uh, the trial ODC has slightly different inclusion criteria and uh, we are not able to derive so much knowledge and uh, interpretation from that trial so one should concentrate on the Fourier and here what they looked at is before randomizing the patient should have LDL greater than 70 milligrams non HDLC more than 100 and then they are randomized to Evolokinab or placebo and now look at their in improvement in LDL levels there is a hoping 59% reduction in LDL, and which was holding over course of 168 weeks of after randomization. On the right side, you see uh, both the uh, primary endpoint, which is a combination of CV death, MI, stroke, unstable angina, and coronary vascular digestion is significantly reduced. And on the right side, you see the secondary endpoint of CVD, MI, stroke, 
also is reduced significantly. Cardiovascular death alone could not be shown uh, difference in Korea uh, trial. And uh, you can see safety events, these are almost placebo like side effects. That is the beauty of uh, PCSK9 inhibitors compared to statins. Statins have a sizable population of patients with uh, statin associated muscle symptoms. PCSK9 inhibitors do not show this. PCSK9 inhibitor side effects are only injection site reactions. None of the other uh, fears that will be an increase in the cancer incidence, cataract, no onset diabetes, if you bring down the LPL so much, none of them have been proven. And it just shows that it, it's a medium powerfully brings down LDL without bringing any side effects. That's the very that's the great beauty of this. Once again, here neurocognitive dysfunction. None of our earlier fears have been uh, you know proven and there is no increase in the hemorrhagic stroke also important. Okay, so we know that these are safe agents, and you can see here a dissection of the data further that those who have residual multi-vessel CDAT more than two prior myocardial infarctions, qualifying MI more than two years, and all of them. The P value is significant, and all the subjects have benefited from using the uh map. And the uh, conclusion is that uolog map on a background of statin therapy lowered LDL levels to a median of 30 milligrams. Further, if you were earlier improved trial got into 50s, these agents have gone into 30s if it is used over and above statin and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. These findings show that patients with symptomatic cardiovascular disease benefit from lowering LDL cholesterol levels much below the current targets. Now, there are a lot of data from Korea trial and I on this slide, this is the peripheral artery disease subset of Korea. Now, what happened? Hello, somebody said something. Okay, and now uh, look at this. The upper two lines demonstrate the reduction in the combined endpoint in those patients who had peripheral artery disease compared to patients who are represented in the lower two lines who did not have peripheral artery disease. PAD patients benefited far more significantly. So, probably, uh, peripheral artery disease patients are one group who should uh, definitely be advised to take the PCSK9 inhibitor along with statin because the benefit in this group is substantial. Not only there is a reduction of CP death, MI, or stroke, even the limb events have been shown to be highly significantly reduced. You can see here on the left side, the curves demonstrate. In those patients who have known PAD, the major adverse limb events are markedly reduced compared to those patients who did not have PAD. So even those patients who did not have PAD at the beginning of the study, the major limb events are reduced, but the reduction is far greater in those patients who had peripheral artery disease at the beginning. So I, I think today peripheral artery disease patients are strong candidates for map therapy or PCSK9 therapy because they not only reduce in these patients, the death, MI, uh, the, they also reduce the limb events. Limb events means development of gangrene or need to an amputation. Okay. Now, this is a very important slide. Not only that, uh, uh, sorry, we have, we have not only the major endpoints that are used in this, uh, uh, this group, those patients. Uh, it, these patients at the end of four weeks developed LDL, which is less than 20 milligrams, and they showed greater reduction of the events of 31 percent compared to the reference. And if the reduction of LDL is only between 72 to 99. As you see in the yellow, yellow line, the reduction is relatively less. So once again, it proves that more the LDL reduction, greater the benefit. Unfortunately, in the alirocumab trial, the ODC trial, when the patients achieved very low levels, they went on to reduce the uh, levels or uh, the injection dose or switched it to placebo. So this kind of data may not come in the uh, alirocumab trial, but in this particular four-year trial, it is very clear. The very low reduction of LDL brought greater benefit without any further increase of uh, side effects. Now, the same thing is now shown in a bar diagram. 
and uh, compared to those patients who developed lesser reduction and LDL is still remaining high, those patients who developed less than 50 milligrams of LDL, they are far greater benefit. Now, Evolocumab in statin intolerant patients. One of the reasons why people were looking for alternate agents was statin intolerance, and this is clearly proven in the GAUS trial. Obviously, these patients did not have any statin on board. What these patients had was a comparison between Evolocumab and Egitimibe, and you can see here that compared to Egitimibe group, the Evolocumab group achieved much greater um, reduction of LDL. Of course, the event rates were not looked for in this particular uh, uh, trial. Obviously, this is a mechanistic study just to prove the point that without statins also, reduction of LDL is very great with uh, the PCSK9 inhibitor. Muzzle-related symptoms were hardly any in a case of 0.7% had muzzle-related symptoms and discontinued the drug with Evolocumab compared to 6.8% with HDMI. So Evolocumab safely and reliably reduced LDLC at 24 weeks compared with HDMIB in a well-phenotyped group of patients who had muzzle-related statin intolerance. Okay. Now, another interesting uh, publication that has come is usage of Evolocumab in acute coronary syndrome patients. The 30-year trial waited for quite some time for your trial. After one year only, these patients were taken up. The uh, trial, which is you are going to see for year, Look for ACS within one year, but here this is given randomize the patients right on day one. Look at this data. These patients, once they are admitted with acute carnage syndrome, they were uh, randomized to evolocumab plus adarvastatin 40 milligrams versus placebo plus adarvastatin. This study clearly shows that four year looked for patients who were uh, having an acute event one year back randomized patients who had ACS within one year, but most patients had it after 2.6 months, they were randomized following ACS. On the other hand, this EVOPAC study, it randomized with it one to three days post ACS. In fact, most patients received it on the first day. Now you can see here that the reduction of LDL is far quicker and greater with Evolocumab plus statin combination compared to statin alone. And if LDL reduction brings benefit, probably uh, a combination that will bring down LDL even further and even quicker should probably reflect in further reduction of events also. The conclusion is that in patients presenting with ACS, Evolocumab initiated in hospital on top of high intensity statin therapy was well tolerated and resulted in substantial reduction in LDLC at the end of eight weeks. Treatment with Evolocumab allowed rapid attainment of currently recommended target LDL C levels by more than in more than 95% of the patients as compared to one third of placebo treated patients. The high dose statin alone got it down in one third of the patients. Here, more than 95% got the LDLC low within no time. Now, uh, naturally, we need to look at the data of alirocumab trial uh, because uh, this, uh, this agent is available abroad, but somehow, for whatever reason, Sanofi has not brought this agent to India and uh, this. Trial also, the Odyssey trial is a very, very positive trial. Uh, it's also uh, a trial that uh, did that was done almost on similar lines as um, the Fourier trial, but with some important differences. Here, the patients who were randomized were more than 40 years. Patients had ACS at 1 to 12 months prior to randomization, and acute myocardial infarction or unstable angina could be there. High intensity statin therapy was there at our dose were maximally tolerated dose of one of these agents for at least two weeks and inadequate control of lipids should be demonstrated. The LDL is more than 70, just like in Fourier trial. And uh, you can see here, undesirably high baseline range. Uh, they allowed this alirocumab to bring down the LDL levels. Only difference is these people but not this group of investigators thought that if you bring it down extremely low, it might not be beneficial, it may be harmful. Therefore, when the LDL came uh, below 15, they stopped giving them uh, the particular drug. They actually, uh, in a blinded fashion, they switched over to placebo. That's a small difference, but that's one reason why you cannot really talk much about uh, extremely low levels of LDL in this uh, Odyssey trial. Now, 
uh, baseline demographics are almost similar to uh, the earlier uh, trial, the four-year trial. Age is around 58 years and an average. 25% were females. They had hypertension, diabetes, and uh, tobacco smoking in about 25%. Hypertension, 65%. Prime mitral infarction, 18%. Uh, the type of ACS in these patients is important. Uh, the NSTEM was there in about 48%, STEMI in 35%, unstable angina in 66%. Revascularization for index ACS was done in 70%. And all these figures are nearly similar compared to uh, placebo. Now, LDLC was about 87 in the erotumab uh, arm and 87 again in the placebo arm. Now, the therapy, of course, one arm received placebo, the other arm erotumab. High dose ETARVA rosuvastatin was present in 88% of the patients, nearly similar in both these groups. HGMIB was there on board in only about 2 to 3% of uh, patients. Uh, relatively low to moderate dose uh, statin was there in about 8%. So say, this is to say that large majority of the patients in this trial also received high dose, uh, high intensity statin therapy with ETARVA or rosuvastatin. Now here again, the fall of LDL is equally good. In fact, that was 59. Here it is 62%, 62.7% reduction of LDL, which was holding at the end of 48 months. And then the primary efficacy endpoint, once again, with alirokimab shows a significant reduction. And one difference between this trial and the Fourier trial is that with the ODC trial, there is a reduction in the overall mortality also which was statistically significant. The uh, combination of primary endpoint is death, uh, non-fatal MI, ischemic stroke, unstable angina requiring hospitalization. But revascularization is not included in this trial, unlike the Fourier trial. And uh, safety, of course, it is similar, uh, almost placebo-like side effects with alirokimab also. And uh, uh, conclusion is compared to placebo uh, in patients with recent ACS. Uh, alirokimab 75 to 150 milligrams of PKNES every two weeks has brought down the LDL significantly and it reduced the maze, MI and ischemic stroke and was associated with a lower rate of all cause death. It was safe and well tolerated over the duration of the trial. Both these trials have brought down the patient's LDL to very low levels and still safety is demonstrated and increasing efficacy is demonstrated. So you can say today, very confidently, lower the LDL, the better. Now, Inkisiran is another molecule I would like to discuss. And uh, this is also a PCSK9 inhibitor. The earlier two agents were monoclonal antibodies. This is an agent which actually interferes with the biosynthesis of uh, 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 PCSK9. Uh, the, the, you can see here, this is a small interfering double-stranded RNA. It interferes with the uh, this is uh, the, this, the trial is called the Orion 11 trial. Uh, Orion trials is extensive research has been done from starting from Orion 1, all of them using Inclisiran. And uh, you can see here that this uh, uh, agent interfaces with the biosynthesis of uh, uh, PCSK9. And uh, you can see in this that these are all the various uh, trials that have been done. Uh, this trial is still not one that would uh, that can really comment about clinical events, Orion 11. It is still expected, Orion 12, 13, these trials will be telling us more about clinical events, but it shows that the reduction of LDL is consistent. The, um, the beauty of uh, this particular agent is that this is an injection given once in six months. It's almost like, you know, you tell the patient to come up to six months for follow-up. So the beauty is that it is given once in six months and the likelihood of patient accepting this therapy is far greater. Now, here again, the inclusion criteria to the four-year trial and the ODC trial uh, is more than 18 years. AS CBD patients are risk equivalent patients. Statin treatment, maximally tolerated doses is already there. HGMIB is allowed. And uh, you can see here that the LDL reduction is once again very consistent. And you can see here in this, uh, th this uh, um, shows that these are uh, 1,617 patients. The patient's number is enough to talk about LDL reduction, but not enough to talk about events. And the 95% of the patients actually completed this. And um, the um, basic features of these patients at the beginning 
are very similar about 70 percent were men and uh, age is about 65 in both the arms and statin usage was there in more than 95 uh, percent of the patients you can see here that the time average reduction is very great 50 percent reduction of uh, ldl nearly similar to that of uh, the uh, monoclonal antibodies which are used for inhibiting the PCSK9 and here this is also showing a very consistent and very strong reduction of LDL and it is significant. This trial cannot uh, talk about uh, events but at least you can talk about the adverse effects and the adverse effects are not demonstrated in any uh, percentage greater than the placebo. It is almost similar once again a very safe trial and the Orion level conclusion 11 conclusions are that it achieves the durable and potent LDLC reduction with only twice yearly injection. There is excellent safety profile in high cardiovascular risk population. Uh, administration it uh, potentially correlates with typical six monthly patient visits, lends itself to routine clinical practice, enables provider control over medical adherence, so on and so forth. Now, these are various molecules that are being tried uh, against PCSK9. Uh, we have already discussed the first two. There are so many other agents that are coming, single-stranded RNA, uh, which is going to come small molecules, mimetic peptides, adnectin, including vaccination. And the vaccination injection is supposed to be enough once in a year. Uh, although I would say that, in fact, one of these agents is, uh, is orally also it's going to be available, the small molecules. So, you know, things are very good for PCSK9 inhibitors. A lot of research is going to be, is being done. And you can see more and more uh, acceptable, more and more safe PCSK9 inhibitors. If vaccine also comes, nothing like it. Now, uh, another agent that has come recently and has made a big noise. And in fact, in the last one or two months sometime, it has been accepted uh, by US FDA. And probably it's going to be in India uh, earlier than later, that is pempedoic acid. The name doesn't sound very sexy, but this is a very interesting molecule. Now, what is its mechanism of action? This is somewhat similar to statins. Statins interfere with the biosynthesis of LDL. And here, you can see here that the cholesterol biosynthesis is also inhibited by pempedoic acid. It is inhibited two steps proximal to the point where HMGCOA reduction occurs. So it is, uh, once again, because of its uh, very action, uh, the bempedoic acid upregulates LDL receptors and lowers LDL cholesterol. Uh, this is a prodrug, unlike uh, statins. And, uh, and peculiarly, the um, drug doesn't have any role in skeletal muscles. Therefore, it is expected that bempedoic acid will not have the muscle symptoms which statins are associated and in the least cases it may be a nuisance and the worst cases it can be rhabdomyolysis. So vampidoic acid from that uh, angle it is far safer than statins. The trial also is there and uh, these trials are all called clear trials. There are so many trials uh, which have come in the beginning to prove the point. They have tried it even in statin intolerant patients now the trial I'm going to show you is clear wisdom trial, which is once again a mechanistic trial to show the reduction of LDL and whether that is consistent. The outcomes trial, the clear outcomes trials results are expected. Probably it will come very soon. And you can see here in the clear wisdom trial uh, that uh, there is a significant reduction of LDL. There is also a significant reduction of HSCRP. The primary end endpoint is change in LDLC from baseline for pempedoic acid versus placebo, uh, change in HSCRP from baseline at week 12. And uh, conclusions from wisdom are that pempedoic acid is safe and effective in reducing LDLC compared with placebo among patients with atherosclerotic vascular disease. Or they also included patients of familial hypercholesterolemia. Patients, all these patients are already on maximum tolerated statin therapy. No difference was noted for clinical outcomes because these trials were not powered for this. And this is a relatively recent publication. And you can see here that there is a reduction of LDL uh, cholesterol, there is a reduction of total cholesterol, FOB reduction is there, non-HDL reduction is there, and HSCRP is also reduced. 
conclusion is in this 52 week trial bempedoic acid added to maximally tolerated statin therapy and did not lead to a higher incidence of overall adverse effects than placebo and led to significantly lower ldl cholesterol as i said earlier this has recently been approved by fda and that's a good thing so you you have a orally effective agent which acts very similar to statins without the muscle related symptoms and probably this is going to give a run for the money for statins in near future now there are other agents also lumetapine and uh, mepomercine these are agents which also work against uh, uh, ldl cholesterol bringing down the levels but these are all at various uh, levels and they are not clinically acceptable they are only used in the treatment of uh, uh, homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia in special clinics and uh, uh, this is uh, what you have from the old trials is high ldl is bad the average is not good and lower the ldl is better as you can show in the tnt trial even lower is better this data has specifically come from the pcsk9 inhibitor trials and improved trial and the lowest is best that we have data today from the fourier sub analysis and uh, there are other non lipid lowering therapeutic agents with potential cardiovascular benefits uh, which are also uh, at the research level they are not discussed in this talk but this includes inhibitors of lipoprotein a lp little a inhibitor apolipoprotein c3 angiopoietin like 3 so much uh, research is being done in relation to reduction of ldl and in pursuit of the ldl hypothesis and another trial which is not exactly a ldl reducing uh, agent but uh, this also is beyond statics this, this trial again is uh, done by dr deepak but and uh, you all have heard it reduce the trial the earlier trials were all negative trials when it came to using the so called fish uh, fatty acids or anthrey fatty acid the doses used were very small they were using about 1 g of icosapentaenoic acid the reduce trial it used but the dose used was 2 g bd that means 4 g per day did not use the naturally available icosapentaenoic acid they modified it in such a way that it is easy for acceptance for the patient the primary endpoint here is cb death mi stroke coronary revascularization and unstable angina and this has shown significant reduction in primary endpoint they used the acid by icosopan ethyl this called 2 g bd is superior to placebo in reducing triglycerides and cb events on the ldl and uh, anyway uh, 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 among patients with high triglycerides already on statin therapy so the patients who were randomized to this are those who have therapy and still have elevated triglycerides for both primary and secondary prevention used the high doses of this and have shown significant benefit so this also has been included recently in the guidelines of acc and esc for particular situations and along with therapeutic lifestyle interventions today we are well armed with pharmacotherapeutic agents statins non statins to reduce ldlc and of course the last trial included use triglycerides also dr pranav and dr manoria sir uh, you can conclude sir your mic is off sir now it's on sir please okay uh, very exhaustive and uh, very excellent talk by dr sarath chandra i would like to give some comments thank you Uh, the PCSK9 has actually demystified the nuances of LDL, and there are very big messages from lipid. The first big message is LDL as low as 10 milligram is safe, and the side effects are not due to drug. Side effects are due to drug and not due to lowering of LDL. The side effects which you get with statins are because of statins, and not because of lowering of LDL. So we are very clear. Lowering of LDL even to super low levels, they are safe. The second big message all of us know: LDL is normal level is 25, and cholesterol deposition stops when the LDL is lowered below 
the other message is that if you start statin therapy or pcsk9 therapy if your ldl is above 100 there is mortality benefit but if your ldl at the time of initiation of therapy is 70 or less there is only lowering of cardiovascular events and no mortality benefit dr sarachandra very clearly showed that uh, the alarcomab trial or see outcome with the subgroup analysis was done when LDL was more than 100, there was mortality benefit in terms of all cause mortality, but a trial as a whole failed to show benefit uh, in all cause mortality or CNT mortality. The four year trial also did not show any mortality benefit. The other thing we are very expecting is that statins have very clearly shown the legacy effects. You take uh, statins for five years, as was shown by Voskops, enjoy the legacy benefits. For the next 20 years but uh, we have no such data for the legacy effect with pcsk9 as yet to the best of my knowledge if the legacy effects also appear with pcsk9 it will be a very great achievement and uh, the another new data which has come with pcsk9 is that pcsk9 the four-year trial the follow-up after one year has shown that it also decreases bte and this was shown only in patients where lpa was elevated this effect was not due to lowering of LDL, but only due to lowering of LPA, which means LPA, which is exogenic and prothrombotic. It is prothrombotic not only for the arteries, it is prothrombotic also for the veins. And this is a, a new development. And PCSK9, uh, Dr. Saran Chandra has already talked about a single injection decreased LDL by 50%, and this remains there for one year. And if this comes out to be a real reality, a booster dose every year will be the new way to target atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Thank you very much. Sir, so I, I just want to say, uh, re-emphasize that uh, this is one of the few agents that has brought down the LP little a also. Yes. Uh, earlier we had a nicotinic acid, which was available in Indian market. Interestingly, it was again Redilapse, which has uh, brought it. But, uh, you know, the trials did not support it. So uh, the focus on LP little a went away and it has disappeared. Now, once again, you have an agent, uh, which is PCSK9, and uh, uh, it has been shown not only LDL, there is a reduction of LP little a, mm -hmm. there is a reduction of uh, venous thromboembolism. Of course, as you said, legacy effect. Uh, the time is too short to talk about uh, legacy effect. Yeah. Yeah, these are the agents which have come only recently. I, I think uh, if... Uh, you know, leave the vapidoic acid for a moment to the side. Today, after statins, the most powerful agent you have in the market, which is available readily with minimal side effects, is uh, PCSK9 inhibitors. The presently, it is uh, injectable. So soon, you will have more and more agents, maybe oral agent also may come. Uh, vapidoic acid, as you have seen, it's also a very interesting agent. They have not compared it with statin. They compared it with agitamide combination, versus agitamide alone, but I am also hopeful that this drug will have all the benefits of, uh, uh, you know, what statins would show, uh, probably with this. Uh, I, I, uh, the PCS okay. for a long time, my friend also spoke for a long time. Yeah. The PCS can I decrease LDL by 25%. Uh, the Inclisran has shown that it decreases LDL uh, LPA by 80%. So this is the second drug after uh, PCSK9, which decreased by 25%. It decreased LPA by 80%. And there are new drugs also being tried, which will further decrease LPA. So in times to come, we will have an evidence-based target for LPA based on just we as an LDL target on various subsets. Yeah. So that is the hope for the future. Incidentally, the doctor who is spearheading the research in Inclisiran is our own Indian, Dr. Kaushik Ray from London. I'm sure you all met him in uh, one of these forums. Uh, he's regularly there presenting the data on Inclisiran. So I think, uh, sir, I think it's to... quite late, maybe. Quite late now. So uh, the next class was, would be on 6th uh, June, that Saturday night, 8 o'clock. And we'll have only one topic there, okay. then, uh, echocardiography. And meanwhile, I request I think it's a good that, suggestion. Yeah. Sir. And uh, no, yeah. you know, I was saying that have one one topic, like what Ranjan, you know, you, you have to do justice 
you should allow him to speak for a longer time and then the questions yeah. and discussion i suggest you have one talk at a given time half an hour yeah. 45 yeah. minutes and you can discuss uh, yeah. like that length I, i think sir we'll we'll follow that because you know it's it's a new thing for me also so uh, i'm getting it's a second second episode that we had so with time uh, we'll improvise and uh, with your input that is what i'm asking wherever you feel that we can improve this because i i'd like to have this continued uh, after covid also maybe once in a month but uh, like good sir good sir uh, can i one show one slide for covid sir Very sure interesting sir. always sir. It. All sure, of, sure sir all of just share it all of you will enjoy it it's not a slide just a message we have one of the medical uh, doctor in bilaspur has become covid positive that is what you are flashing here Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I have the sharing of? Uh, we have not yet got any positive COVID. <laughs> we are not treating it. COVID hospitals are different. Yeah. Stop sharing, Karuna. Please. ये तो सही है ना ये आ रहा है उसको तो मिक्स मिक्स में किसी के और मिक्स दिस इज द मैसेज फॉर ऑल ऑफ अस पर्टिकुलरली फॉर डॉक्टर शरद चंद्र वी आर अलाउड टू बैक टू वर्क हेलो आर यू एबल टू सी द स्लाइड नॉट येट सर No, no, not yet. Still loading. Okay, still loading. Uh, it is still loading. Okay. Meanwhile, sir, uh, there is a, a PGI Cardiology YouTube channel which we have started. The address is given in the chat, so everyone can subscribe that. And all these uh, lectures that have happened in the last class and this class, they'll be uploaded there. last class has have already been uploaded this class would be uploaded in one or two days and we'll continue to upload these in pgi cardiology youtube channel but that will be accessible only to us the pgl uh, the slide is not uploading we'll show it next time sir you can whatsapp that in the group sir okay okay thank you sir uh, thank thank you dr sir so thank you so much you. yeah dr manoria and thank you very everybody much. there ranjan shetty yeah. and uh, yeah thanks a lot good day so again on fix sir thank you thank you thank you bye thank you good see you. i thank ajanta uh, fund i thank uh, mankind also for uh, having all these things set up uh, especially thanks to samir who has taken up a lot of pains on my behalf sir thank you thank you bye have a great week please sir please please